In this video, we're going to address the concept of inertia. In mainstream physics, the concept of inertia is generally misunderstood and therefore not taught very well. In order to teach something, one must fully understand it. Ken Wheeler says that only two things exist in the universe, inertia and loss of inertia. He also says that loss of inertia necessitates the creation of space. The way I say it is a little different. When I tell it, I like to use the creation story. Every culture that ever existed on Earth has a creation story that starts something like this. In the beginning was something, and God said, let there be something else. I'm going to use this language as a teaching tool. For the record, I'm in no way preaching about God or saying that God created anything necessarily. You can believe what you want regarding God. This is your prerogative. Ken says, only two things exist in the universe, inertia, inertia and loss of inertia. Ken says that loss of inertia necessitates the creation of space. I say, in the beginning was inertia, and God said, let there be loss of inertia. Loss of inertia necessitates the creation or existence of space. In other words, loss of inertia requires space to exist. Does loss of inertia create space? Well, let's see what the logic tells us. In the beginning was counter space, and God said, let there be space. So obviously, space needs to exist and or be created in order for space to exist. This, of course, is the trivial case. This is the redundant case. Now I'm going to show you a few more examples. In the beginning was silence, and God said, let there be sound. Clearly sound, i.e. the propagation of sound, requires the existence of space. In the beginning was darkness, and God said, let there be light. Light, that is the propagation of light, clearly requires the existence of space. In the beginning was stillness, and God said, let there be motion. Clearly, motion requires the existence of space. In the beginning was charge, and God said, let there be discharge. I want you to imagine that a supernova explosion is a discharge event. Clearly, discharge requires the existence of space. So back to this. In the beginning was inertia, and God said, let there be loss of inertia. Loss of inertia requires the existence of space. But to me, there's always seems to be something missing from these three statements. There is, in fact, a missing piece of the puzzle. In the beginning was inertia, and God said, let there be loss of inertia. Now here's the missing piece. Loss, as loss of inertia requires the existence of space, inertia requires the existence of counter space. Okay? Inertia requires the existence of counter space. This is not something that Ken has ever specifically said, but it's implied in all of his work. Inertia requires the existence of counter space. Inertia and counter space are two sides of the same coin. So these are the four statements that are going to drive most of the rest of the discussions in my video series, Understanding Ken Wheeler's Missing Secrets of Magnetism. In this video, we're going to specifically talk about inertia. What is inertia? How does mainstream define inertia? How does Ken define inertia? And how do I define inertia? After watching this video, you are going to understand the term inertia better than all the mainstream scientists on planet Earth, in my humble opinion, of course. In the beginning was inertia. If there was a beginning, then inertia came first. But what exactly is inertia? Let's start with some mainstream definitions of inertia. Inertia, a tendency to do nothing or to remain unchanged. Inertia, a property of matter by which it continues to exist in a state of rest or uniform motion in a straight line unless that state is changed by an external force. 
Here, inertia is defined as a property of matter. However, a physical property is any property that is measurable and whose value describes the state of a physical system. Physical properties are measurable. They have values in units. Here, I argue that inertia is not directly measurable and therefore has no value. Ken says, Ken Wheeler says, that counter space has no locus. By analogy then, inertia can have no value. Inertia on, in of itself cannot be quantified. The reason for this is because inertia comes in many forms. It is not just one thing, it is many things. Mass is a form of inertia. Momentum is a form of inertia. Energy, in fact, is a form of inertia, and we'll get into that at a, in a later video. There are many more. Inertia in of itself is not measurable and therefore has no uniquely identifiable units. Measurable things must have uniquely define, definable, identifiable units. Unit analysis is the key to understanding inertia, uh, and we'll be getting back to this shortly. Newton's Law of Inertia. An object at rest remains at rest unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. An object in motion remains in motion unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. So here, right away, you can see that there are at least two kinds of inertia. One pertaining to objects at rest and the other pertaining to objects in motion. And we'll get back to this in a minute as well. First, we need to look at one more definition of inertia. And this one is the key. Inertia. Resistance of any physical object to any change in its state of motion. This includes changes to an object's speed, direction, or state of rest. This definition is more accurate. Inertia is resistance to change of state. Or put simply, Inertia is resistance to change. Resistance to any change can be considered inertia. This may sound like a dumb question, but what, is, what exactly is change? In order to understand resistance to change, we need to understand change. So here is a short list of the many ways that an object can change. There may be more, but this is what I came up with uh, off the top of my head. Let's go through each of these one by one. An object can change in position, or not change in position. An object in stillness remains in stillness unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. Change in position requires an unbalanced force. An object moving at a constant speed can change its velocity. An object in motion remains in motion unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. Change in velocity is called acceleration and deceleration. Change in velocity requires unbalanced forces. An object can spin or not spin. A spinning object remains spinning unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. It takes an unbalanced force to spin an object. It also takes an unbalanced force to stop an object, to stop an object from spinning. Change in direction. An object moving through space can change in direction. Or you can change its or you can change the direction of spin from clockwise to counterclockwise and vice versa. These kinds of changes all require unbalanced forces. An object an object can also change its orientation or not. This is particularly true of spinning objects. An object in procession remains in procession unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. Change in size is another kind of change. Growth and expansion are two ways that things can change in size. Phase transition is another way that things can change in size. This one is a bit more difficult to explain in terms of inertia. An object that is small remains small unless acted upon by an external force. Take a seed for, for example. The seed is completely inertial and very small. 
until you supply it with external things such as water and light. If the seed is inertia, then growth of the plant is loss of inertia. As I said earlier, inertia requires the existence of counter space. This is why the seed is so small. Loss of inertia requires the existence of space. Without space, there's nowhere for the plant to grow. This is what I mean when I say inertia is many things. Inertia does not just pertain to an object in motion through space. Change in morphology is another way things can change. Phase transitions are generally associated with morphological changes. Take cymatics, for example, where sound vibrations are used to change the patterns of sand on a vibrating plate. A change in the frequency of the sound will change the morphology of the pattern. Aging can be considered as a change in morphology. We all experience morphological changes throughout our lives. First, when we are born, we are very small. Then we grow in size. Then we grow in maturity. Then we grow in age. At all times in our lives, we are experiencing morphological changes. We all wish we could stop these morphological changes. No one wants to grow old. We could, in fact, stop these morphological changes by cryogenically freezing ourselves. This slows down all the clocks in our body and puts us into a state of inertia. Remember, inertia is resistance to change. So as we are frozen, our cells and all the atoms in the cells are resisting the morphological changes of the aging process. But if we cryogenically froze ourselves, we would not be able to experience life because life is the experience of continuous change. Without change, time would not exist. Inertia is resistance to change. Let's consider our first example of change, that is, change in position. Objects that are changing their position or location are said to be in motion. Objects that aren't changing their position or location are said to be at rest. Objects that are more massive require more force to get them moving. In a similar manner, objects that are more massive require more force to stop an object from moving. But what is mass? In order to understand inertia, we need to have a clear understanding of what mass is. Although inertia and mass are intimately related, inertia is not mass, and mass is not inertia. Mass and inertia have different definitions. In chemistry, mass is defined as a quantity of matter. For example, a one kilogram mass is a quantity of matter that happens to weigh one kilogram here on Earth. If we bring the same one kilogram mass to the moon, it will weigh less, but it still contains the same quantity of matter. If we bring the same kilogram mass into deep space far away from any gravitational body, it will be weightless, but it still contains the same quantity of matter. The only thing has it, that has changed here was the quantity of matter of the moon and the quantity of matter of the earth, but the one kilogram mass itself has not changed. Thus, to prevent any confusion, it's better to think of mass in terms of quantity of matter rather than how much it weighs in different locations within the universe. This may seem obvious to some, but it's not so obvious to others, which is why I'm pointing it out here. Mass is a quantity of matter. As I said previously, mass is not inertia and inertia is not mass. Mass and inertia have different definitions. Inertia is resistance to change, and mass is a quantity of matter. So what about inertial mass? Mass as a quantity of matter is merely one form of inertia. As I said before, inertia comes in many forms. In terms of inertial mass, it's true that the tendency of an object to resist changes in its state of motion varies with mass. For example, a two kilogram mass will resist changes to its motion more than a one kilogram mass, obviously. However, mass is only one part of the equation. The tendency of an object to resist changes to a state of motion also depends on its velocity. 
Imagine two objects of equal mass. One is moving 3 meters per second, and the other one is moving 300 meters per second. Which one is going to be harder to stop? Have you ever tried to stop a bullet? In this case, the quantity of matter did not change, but the velocity of the object changed. Did the mass increase? Did the quantity of matter of the material object increase? No, it did not. Did the inertia increase? Did the inertia change? Yes. The tendency to resist the change are greater for faster objects. I'm going to say that again. The tendency to resist change are greater for faster objects. The object with the higher velocity has more inertia. That is, it resists change more. Although mass is still involved, mass and inertia are not the same thing. Increase in inertia does not require increase in mass, necessarily. In this case, increase in inertia is caused by increase in velocity, and mass stays the same. Also, as you will see, the two kinds of inertia that I just showed you have different units. What are units? In physics, it is customary to assign different units to different domains of a system. For example, in the NIST standard, the unit for the domain of time is the second. The unit for the domain of space is the meter. And the unit for the domain of mass is the kilogram. Keep in mind that these are arbitrary reference units that are calibrated for the convenience at the human scale. The second is approximately the time for one human heartbeat. The meter is approximately the length of a human limb. The kilogram is also an arbitrary mass. Most human beings can easily lift a one kilogram mass. So these units are arbitrary units calibrated to the human scale. There is nothing special about them other than the fact that all other measurements in science are measured relative to the standard units. In short, all measurements in physics and science must be referenced against some precisely calibrated reference units. The NIST standard use the second, the meter, and the kilogram as the reference units for the domains of time, space, and mass, respectively. So, what are the units of inertia? As I said previously, the two kinds of inertia that I just showed you have different units. A quantity of matter not in motion is one form of inertia. We call this rest mass and assign it the unit of the kilogram. A quantity of matter in motion is another form of motion. We call this momentum and it has units kilogram meters per second. Notice that the units of momentum can contain the units of mass and the units of velocity. Clearly you can see from this that the units of, of momentum are merely mass in motion. Momentum is mass times velocity. Of course this is well known. We are not doing anything new here. I'm just explaining it differently. Here's where it gets interesting. Einstein said that when an object is accelerated, it increases in inertia. But inertia is resistance to change. Einstein said that when an object increases in velocity, resistance to change also increases. He did not say that mass increases with increase in velocity. He only ever said that inertia increased with increase in velocity. In this slide, I showed you that inertia can increase with increase in velocity. It is much harder to stop a bullet fired out of a gun than one that I throw at you with my bare hands. See what I mean? The scientific community, however, seems to be saying that mass increases with velocity. They seem to be saying that the quantity of matter changes when you change the velocity of said matter. But Einstein himself only ever said that inertia increases with velocity. Here we can see that inertia increases in mass and inertia increases in, with increase in velocity. Inertia increases with increase in mass and inertia increases with increase in velocity. 
Mass does not increase with increase in velocity. The quantity of matter does not change with increase in velocity. It is impossible and illogical for the quantity of matter to increase with increase in velocity. In other words, when particles are accelerated in particle accelerators, they do not increase in mass. Their quantity of matter never changes. What changes is velocity. Inertia changes because of velocity has changed. Mass as a quantity of matter never increases in a particle accelerator. I'm going to say that again. Mass as a quantity of matter never increases in a particle accelerator. If relativity is saying that mass increases in a particle accelerator, then relativity is wrong. Inertia increases when velocity increases. And mass can stay the same. So let's recap what we learned today. Okay? Inertia is defined as resistance to change. Mass is defined as a quantity of matter. Mass is one form of inertia. Momentum is another form of inertia. Accelerating particles in particle accelerators do not increase in mass. Mass, as a quantity of matter, does not change when it is set into motion. In the beginning was inertia, and God said, let there be loss of inertia. In the beginning was resistance to change, and God said, let there be change. In the beginning was counter space, and God said, let there be space. In the beginning was permanent, and God said, let there be temporary. This last statement is a clue to my next video, which will be primarily focusing on the concept of loss of inertia.